I'd like to um, move on to the first part of our program today um, uh, and introduce uh, Paul Alavisados. Um, so Paul is appropriately our first speaker. He's, um, of course, the former director of uh, Berkeley Lab uh, and current uh, vice chancellor for research at the University of California, Berkeley. He's a key founder of the Molecular Foundry, absolutely central figure in um, developing the concept, the proposal in, the, in our center, and our, and our first director um, uh, of the Molecular Foundry. So, and uh, I should also note, finally, he's a current user of the Foundry. So, uh, uh, so thank you, Paul, and I'd like to invite you to the stage and uh, uh, get you uh, started. So please welcome Paul Alessandro. Well, thank you so much, Jeff, and, and it's a wonderful day. It's really a very special, special day, I think. Um, the Foundry is a community, um, above all, and it's a community that practices science in a very important field, a foundational field, really, for, for modern materials at the highest possible level. And it is also um, a community that is completely open and sharing. And uh, that openness and willingness to share is actually what derives so much of its strength. There are many places that, that practice nanoscience at a high level, but the openness and the sharing and the connectivity is what makes the impact of the foundry so absolutely enormous. And I thought I'd just take a couple of minutes to talk about that. There are so many people in this room that I see who um, made this happen. And so it's wonderful to celebrate with all of you. Um, you know, the start was, in fact, with the beginning of the nanotechnology initiative, which was forming um, uh, during this period in the late 1990s. And um, uh, during that time, uh, Tom Khalil at the White House uh, was uh, fostering uh, these kinds of discussions. Uh, we were working uh, to help inside the uh, NSF to create some of this work. And um, as I'll, I was tutored at that time, um, by the gentleman you see here, Danielle Shemla, who was an amazing, amazing human being who uh, uh, was encouraging me to become involved uh, at a larger level than I had imagined I ever would be in anything. And, and so he was a, a great inspiration. And so I, I got you know, involved in things like this and, and, and meeting with Tom Khalil and so on. And um, during that time, um, all of the agencies uh, started to think about what they might do with something like this. Of course, meanwhile, relying upon Congressman Honda, <laughs> who's right here, and who was really the shepherd, <laughs> the, the shepherd of, uh, of all of the, um, uh, you know, uh, congressional efforts uh, to, to, to help the science community realize uh, it, it, its vision. And so all of the agencies were sitting there looking at tables like this and thinking, ha, huh, Money is coming our way. <laughs> How shall we spend it? And um, I had, uh, because I had been involved earlier in some of the planning before uh, the agencies knew that they would be getting these kinds of funds, uh, Pat Damer uh, asked me to be a part of a small group that spent um, th uh, that summer um, meeting uh, uh, um, several times in, in headquarters um, talking about um, what could DOE do? <laughs> Uh, and all the agencies, of course, were going to do many different things. Many of them were going to establish a, a series of single investigator programs. They were going to establish some um, science and technology centers, all kinds of things of this type. And so, so there was a discussion. There was a debate going on about um, what could ultimately this entity, what could DOE do? What kind of investment could it make that would truly be important uh, for, for, for nanoscience? And uh, the per person I want to call out right here is Paul McEwen, uh, who's a um, wonderful, wonderful scientist and good friend. And um, Paul and I were asked by uh, Danielle in an early stage um, to work with Mark Alper. Mark, is Mark here? There he is. And Mark was really, um, played such an enormous role in, uh, in really catalyzing this and in bringing both Paul McEwen and I together because we really were both kind of, um, you know, loose cannons and didn't really know how to do anything. 
and and so so he was thoughtful and disciplined and 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 just did such an amazing job, and and so we had I, I vividly remember some of our discussions and and the question is well what what should this thing really be like, personally I had the experience at that time that we had uh, developed uh, the use of quantum dots for various kinds of um, luminescent and imaging applications in biology and other things like that. And I would go out to seminars uh, at different places. And afterwards, lots of people would come up because at that time, the ability to make the materials was really very foreign to most people. And uh, so they'd come up and they'd say, well, you know, can you help us? Can you send us some material? <laughs> so, uh, you know, one answer to that was to create a commercial entity that would sell them. Uh, but the other one, was to say, well, if you want to learn to practice in this field, you actually have to learn how to make them yourself. And, and so what I would do, because it's just my personality, is I invited people to come to my lab and spend a couple of weeks. You know, they'll learn. And um, so I was doing that every time people would ask. And one day my research group came to me in rebellion, <laughs> saying, you may not invite another human being to our lab. <laughs> this is done. <laughs> And so there we were with meeting with Mark and Paul McEwen and discussing these things and saying, you know, look, people want to practice this at a high level, but it's got a lot of complexity. It's got a lot of uncertainty how to do it, and people, you know, are, are wanting to learn. Why don't we, why don't we make this a feature of, of what we're doing? And, and, and so that was our thinking, at least at that time, locally. Of course, there's many other folks on here. You saw Carolyn already. Um, I just have to mention um, the, the, you know, Chuck Shank, who... Uh, created an atmosphere at the laboratory where this was all possible and who really um, helped to create uh, all of the early seed funds. A lot of early seed fund investment. Uh, there was a one stage where well, we were supported for a nanoscience effort in the abstract and the second stage where we were supported to bring in that group of postdocs uh, before the DOE funded it and then subsequently uh, we got some DOE funding for it, which, which kind of laid some of the early groundwork. So Chuck played an absolutely vital role, and, and, and Danielle. And of course, then the group, um, um, Jean Frechet, who's um, you know, in, in Saudi Arabia now, but, uh, but present here are, are, are Miguel Salmeron and Steve Louie and Jeff Boker. And, and this group, uh, absent Paul, who, was, who was, went off to Cornell, um, but we still love him. Uh, this group actually, as, as Jeff said, became the kind of nucleus of thinking very hard about this and trying to see how we could make it work. And it was a great and wonderful time. Now, there's two things I have to say about it that I just want to bring out there. One was I learned an awful lot about um, how buildings get built. And at, you know, one thing that happened, I was called to this meeting, I was, you know, I was, I was going to bunch of conference, I was called to this meeting in Washington and I, I showed up there. And I learned something, I learned that, there, I showed up at this thing and I learned that there's this process in DOE called critical decisions. <laughs> so critical decisions, zero, one, for those of you who follow these things, showing up at a meeting and not knowing that that's what you were showing up to is kind of not the way to do it. And uh, <laughs> so we had a wonderful vision, which was this vision that we would, we would create these um, uh, places where people could come and share. Uh, but we had not really done very good homework. And, and Dieter asked us here. And he was, uh, he was on, the, on, on the panel of people that was looking at these kinds of things and just said, uh, these, these Berkeley folks, they have an interesting idea, but they've done no homework. And so you know, we had a near-death experience due to my lack of experience. And, um, and then, fortunately, um, Chuck and Danielle uh, searched around the laboratory and found Jim Krupnik. And Jim stepped in and, and immediately settled all of these things. And within days, he had us uh, organized and thinking about how to actually go through the process of creating a real entity. Because we had an idea, but we didn't know how to do it. And, and, and Jim, of course, uh, that experience uh, placed him on a track, ultimately, to become um, the chief operating officer later on for this laboratory. The other thing I learned a lot about was how architects do their business. And you can see uh, the Smith Group, some of their early designs uh, uh, that, that they were engaged in. And of course, it came out that way. And, and um, so I had lots and lots of discussions with the architects. And just you know, to give you one flavor of it, there were some hard parts and some easy parts with that, or some fun parts. So the, the, the hardest part was that they immediately conceptualized this cantilever. And I personally, was completely um, horrified by this. 
because all I could think about was vibrations, right? I mean, that was it. And, 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 and it was um, quite an experience because the architects really wanted the cantilever. And <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know how to operate in a world like that. And it turned out that they did. And so at a certain point, it was far enough along in the designs that there was no changing it, uh, even if I jumped up and down all I wanted. And, and so then, you know, I was uh, just so worried about this, and I went back to Jim and just said, you know, I just think this could be the biggest mistake ever. And, and, and he said, okay, uh, we're going to figure this out. And he got a whole group of people to do um, a, a very extensive set of mechanical simulations um, with and without designs that had uh, the, the cantilever in it, and they, they proved that it was going to be okay. <laughs> now, although that was a difficult period with the architects, we talked a lot, and they wanted to know what is nanoscience, because they didn't know. And so I told them, you know, as I've said in many other uh, occasions, well, imagine that you have a piece of gold and you break it in two, and then, you know, it's still gold, but you keep doing that over and over again. Eventually, it become tiny particles. They won't be the same anymore. And, and, and they listened. And so outside, if you go uh, by the foundry, you'll see that there's these ser series of rocks. And here are the big rocks and the middle rocks, and then the littler rocks, and then inside are the nanoparticles. And they were trying to make it up to me about the cantilever, okay? <laughs> and since they were right, you know, okay. Um, I do want to acknowledge Pat Damer. I mean, what an amazing leader. Uh, she uh, really um, had to fight, fight hard to develop this concept of the user facilities and to create a space for it inside the Department of Energy. And it wasn't an easy thing to do. And, and she was absolutely brilliant at doing it. And so we owe her a great deal. Um, um, I, I think many of you know that later on in my career, I spent an enormous amount of time developing a warm and cordial relationship with the community that surrounds us. <laughs> I did. And, this was a moment uh, because we had a, a hearing nearby and there was somebody who had like a video camera right in my face saying, how does it feel to be developing fourth generation nuclear weapons and things like that. You know, I mean, I, there was really a community that didn't know what we were doing and they were just really upset at us. And it's because we didn't take the time to engage the, the community that surrounded us early to talk with them about what we do and, and what it means and why it, it fulfills aspirations for society and all of those things. So we just, we just didn't, we know, sort of just blithely walked through it. So it was another part of my education in life and then later on I had a chance to kind of atone for, for not having done things uh, so well. Uh, we're so proud of everything that's happened here. Uh, the group of six did something that I just want to mention to you. Um, so all these uh, centers were being started all over the place, and they were opportunities for people who were prominent in the field to have resources personally to do research. <laughs> and we made a determination amongst ourselves that what we would do is fulfill this concept of a community resource, and that the essence of doing that would be to recruit new people who are at the beginnings of their career but had a lot of talent, and to foster them, and to press them to have scientific excellence and to press them to serve the, the community and to do both of those at the same time. And we, so, so, so we did that recruiting and we brought in this incredible group and then we stepped back. We really stepped back. And I think that was uh, an important decision in creating something that isn't the specific uh, outcomes of one individual's research agenda but is really something that serves the world in a broader way. And, and, and so that was an important step. In fact, I do vividly remember in an early, Carolyn was joking about DOE reviews, there was an early review where after the thing had you know, first started where we really got hammered and everyone was saying, why isn't Paul Alivisatos inside here? Why isn't Jean Fourche inside here? Where are they? You know, and, and, so and we're going back and saying, look, we got you, Jeff Neaton. <laughs> we got you, you know, Jim DiOrio, all these folks who are here right now, uh, Ron Zuckerman. Uh, these are the people who are the future, and they're going to create a community around them, and that community is going to be self-sustaining. You don't want us to come in and, and, and clone ourselves. We're, we're here already. And, and, and that, I think, is, uh, you know, the concept of truly sharing has been vital for it, and, and it is the essence of why, why it has worked well. Um, 
I just want to say that, you know, I, I'm so, it brings tears to my eyes to think about what an incredible place it's become. And I want to remind you that it's great and you're doing lots of wonderful work. But we're here specifically to bring this great field of science to bear on the great science and technology challenges that really face society today. And, and, and a lot of great groundwork has happened there, but in your second 10 years, we're all looking at you <laughs> and we're wanting to see how you can really help change the conversation around making uh, renewable energy something that is truly available, uh, stored, and uh, uh, accessible uh, for transportation and everything else. And we want to see you help uh, to make a, a huge difference in the emerging field of uh, precision medicine and other areas of, of that type. We want to see you make a difference in what happens with the environment going forward, not just in energy, but in making resilient environments and so on. Those are your, uh, those are your challenges. And so as you create this powerful community, uh, it's, it's, it's vital that you do that. And it's vital that society feel the benefits of this organization uh, because it's such a strong one. And, and one of those that I'm so excited about is actually the emergence of um, uh, early, you know, fairly early on in its first decade, we had a lot of folks come uh, from their own, start their own startup company inside the foundry so that they could reduce the requirement to have uh, capitalization uh, that isn't necessary or duplicative, you know. And, and, and that's worked well and now the lab is kind of creating that into a whole model and, and, and I hope that the society feels those benefits because that is why Congressman Honda uh, and his colleagues um, to, were, who were visionary, that was what they're looking to see from us is that we, we redound benefit to the society that has supported us in this way and, and now's the time. Um, I do think that it's been vital to have uh, this um, a model in which you, the scientists have half of their time to perform research and to be at the top uh, in, in terms of their excellence and that half of their time is for sharing and for community engagement. And that's a great formula and I see it, uh, you know, uh, as one that, 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 that the laboratory can really benefit from um, as it goes forward. Um, and so um, those are my thoughts and I'm just so excited to be here with you today and I just want to congratulate all of you because it's wonderful what you've done and uh, it's a great story. Thank you.